So let me call our first case, which is an argument on application, which there'll be 15 minutes per side, Merchant versus Carpenter. Good morning. May it please the court. My name is Robert G. Kamenak. I'm here with my colleague, Karen Beach. We represent the defendant appellant, Dr. Carpenter. Uh, Chief Justice Markman, I'd like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal, please. That would be fine. Thank you, and I will waive the uh, free fire zone. Um, just, I know we have people here that may not be as familiar with the basic background of this case, so I'll spend less than 30 seconds on this, but as the court knows, this is a medical malpractice case that arises out of a claim of negligent surgery by Dr. Carpenter, who is an ENT specialist. Uh, the surgery took place on August 3rd, uh, 2010, um, and the claim was that uh, the doctor uh, impacted what's called the hypoglossal nerve during the course of the surgery, thus resulting in the claim. Um, the, the action was filed in 2012. The matter was tried before a jury in Ingham County, uh, presided over by the Honorable uh, Rosemary um, Aquilina. Um, eight days of trial, seven days of testimony, with a finding of no cause in favor of the defendant, and in particular, a finding of no professional negligence. Um, from there, the case was taken to the Michigan Court of Appeals, and again, uh, as the court already knows, in a split decision, the Michigan Court of Appeals addressed one of the evidentiary issues and found that a new trial should be granted uh, under uh, uh, the court rule at issue in this case, the rule of evidence MRE 404B. Um, what I'd like to stress a couple points to the court that relate back perhaps to the dissent by Judge O'Brien. Um, when we originally received the Court of Appeals opinion, what we found extremely interesting and I think fatal is the fact that with respect to the 404B analysis, which under Justice Bernstein's uh, opinion in Rock versus Crocker, requires a finding of, the, of uh, a 403 analysis. When you go through the majority opinion in this case, which is extensive, there is absolutely no statement whatsoever of the prejudice side of the probative prejudice scale under 403. It is missing. There's not a, a single word about it. Yet, at the same time, the majority found that the trial court had abused its discretion uh, on two separate occasions, and again, as the record shows, um, this matter originally came to Judge Aquilina on a uh, motion in limine. Counsel, good morning, and, and, and welcome to the court. Thank you, Justice. I have a question for you. Sure. Um, help me to understand this issue about standard of care and the issue of charting, you know, as it pertains to the fact that the way that this was charted, the way that this was reported, in terms of the standard of care issue that we kind of have in this case, and the argument that is put forth by the plaintiff that in dealing with this issue of standard and care, it goes to kind of the way that the physician in this case handled his charts well, and, and reported on kind of what people said after the proceedings or procedure. Let me see if I can assist on that, Your Honor. Um, there is, the claim here is limited, the claim of professional negligence is limited to what happened at the time of surgery. Right. There's no debate about that by any of the parties. Um, there was testimony about since, since what happened at surgery may have been um, reflected in office notes and records after the time of the surgery. Um, by way of example, um, whether or not certain symptomology manifested, what type of symptomology it was, and when it manifested, may have reflected, it may circumstantially relate back to what might have happened at the time of surgery. I think that's what you're referring to. Right. Okay, and, and, and uh, I think the parties agree that there was testimony throughout trial on that point. I think where the parties disagree is what was significant testimony in that regard. And as I, as I was getting into a little bit before your question, and I'm happy to answer your question, um, whether or not even if there is some probative value, whether there is, under your opinion, um, a, unanimous, a unanimous opinion, Justice Bernstein, whether there is some legal relevance, whether there is some logical relevance, you have to get to the last step that didn't happen here. And so um, we have 
a very interesting situation because we have an error correcting court, the Michigan Court of Appeals, reversing discretionary decisions of the trial court without completing the analysis whatsoever. And uh, again, I would, I, would, um, I would go back to, I would implore the court to go back to Justice Bryan's uh, uh, dissent in the case. Um, what plaintiff wanted to do, as you know from the record, was to present the testimony of Dr. Morris, and in particular, to present um, supposed mischarting of uh, Dr. Carpenter with respect to other patients who happened to be other plaintiffs. Why Dr. Morris knew about this was that Dr. Morris was the expert witness retained in those other seven cases, all of which were pending in the Ingham County Circuit Court. So not only did we have a situation where you were going to have um, record keeping with respect to other patients, but they were all plaintiffs. What Judge Aquilina understood is that this case is going to spin off into a trial within the trial that it was going to be effectively contaminated by propensity evidence. That no matter, in my view, no matter how many times you might give a limiting instruction, the jury is going to hear about these other cases. And if you, if you work backwards, what would happen, and think about what would happen at the time of trial. Dr. Morris's testimony comes in, is presented to the jury. How is that effectively cross-examined? Well, it's effectively cross-examined and, and we have a right to cross-examine, is you would bring those plaintiffs in, those other patients, you would show their bias because they're saying that their symptomology wasn't recorded in their respective cases. The jury hears that there are other plaintiffs. The jury hears that there's eight other cases pending against Dr. Carpenter. Counsel, could, I, I hate to interrupt, but sure. that's sort of an issue. That can be an issue in any 404B question we face, how far down that, the road of the other acts evidence um, would the court have to go? I have a, a, a simpler question. D did the, the plaintiff ever um, argue when the evidence was proffered that it was admissible under Rule 404B? You, you've, you've talked about one of the elements of that rule. The, the rule is, sets forth a fairly elaborate framework for determining whether this type of other acts or other other acts evidence is, is admissible. So did the plaintiff ever suggest that the evidence was admissible under this rule? Well, there were two occasions where it was just uh, Justice Viviano. The first occasion was in the pretrial motion that I mentioned. Um, this was the motion in, motion in limine by your client? Correct. Regarding other uh, malpractice cases, that was, that was the motion where this was, all, this was teed up originally and where Judge Aquilina ruled on December 16th. And um, it was, there was a single reference to it, but no argument about it in that motion. Now, during the course of a colloquy between court and counsel, there was discussion about, um, other pay, about the record keeping, but there wasn't a specific argument that was made under 404B. And remember, before that, um, Rock versus Crocker had not been issued by that time. But nonetheless, no, there was no argument made at that time. The second time it came up, was during uh, the um, uh, cross-examination of Dr. Carpenter at trial. And um, it 404 wasn't brought up specifically either then, although the record reflects that there was a specific um, argument to be made about the other records. But no, it wasn't brought up under 404B specifically. Does the proponent of evidence under that rule have the obligation to cite the rule just to... Well, when... when, when the, the answer is yes. Well, or more generally, under any rule, I guess. Well, yes, because it's only fair that the trial court know the basis for the admission. And, and if you work backwards from that proposition, it's unfair in many ways to criticize a trial judge for not um, analyzing the case when, uh, and, and supposedly excluding evidence under a particular rule when it wasn't cited to the trial court. Um, there's a couple other points. So the record is devoid, and I would ask the court, um, even if it, it gets through the legal relevance and the logical relevance, that you've got a ruling, you've got, a, you've got an analysis on two occasions by the trial judge. Um, judge O'Brien, I think, does a good job of showing how um, the 403 analysis does not fall outside the range of principled outcomes here. I don't think there's any need for remand to the Court of Appeals 
on that point, especially since Judge Owens is now retired. Um, the other thing I'd like to stress um, is any error here was harmless. Um, there was ample testimony about uh, Dr. Carpenter's supposed poor record keeping. Number one, and it's in the briefs, he admitted that I don't always uh, properly chart uh, symptoms. He came out and right, he said it right after the judge's ruling, by the way. And then what you did is you also had, in this case, you had the plaintiff's experts go through the records. And you had the plaintiff's um, ENT expert, Dr. Morris, saying, I I've gone through the records. Uh, Ms. Merchant said X, it's not in the record. The jury heard all of that. The jury heard from the experts for the plaintiff that Dr. Carpenter had not properly charted. So, it, to, and, and also, if I may, uh, with respect to Dr. Schechter, it, perhaps even more important, he was the neurology expert. And the neurology expert came in and said, you know, the, um, when the defendants were trying to provide an alternative cause for what might have happened, which was infection, he came out and told the jury, the word infection is nowhere in the records. So the jury had more than ample information outside of this other acts to resolve this case. Did the jury hear generally that his record keep <clears throat> was the jury apprised generally that his record keeping was not always of the highest caliber? Or were they informed that in particular his record keeping seemed to be uh, short of the highest standards and precisely the kind of case that we had here, a damaged nerve case? Um, through Dr. Carpenter, Carpenter's testimony and admission, it wasn't as precise as you indicated, Your Honor. He just said on cross-examination after the colloquy between court and counsel that, you know, I'm not, uh, my record keeping isn't 100% accurate and I mischart. He did come out and say that. W with respect to whether that was done in the context of nerve cases, surgery cases, this type of case, um, uh, it wasn't that specific, nor did this special record here come in, uh, talk about anything that that was specific. But counsel, I mean, this is a kind of a unique situation because if I'm not mistaken, weren't there like 10 cases in like a two to three year period that we're dealing with this issue? Oh, well, and, and I'm not asking the court a question, but when you say this issue, perhaps that's the rub, Your Honor. There were, um, there were claims, uh, various claims of negligence brought in the eight cases that were pending before different judges, Judge Aquilina had two of them over in Ingham County. Um, Dr. Morris, when you look at his special record, was going to talk about one case that was arguably similar to this case, which is the same type of surgery, and also two general cases dealing with nerve injury. But yes, there were, there were cases pending. Um, there was, I'm, I'm sure the doctor, the record does not reflect this, but, but the I, issue though, I guess the, if you can just help me navigate this, sure. the issue is the scheme or practice and the, the concern that was kind of developed was that if you're looking at the issue or practices that there was a failure to record the fact that similar problems had developed in these other cases. Well, Your, Your Honor, there, once again, the sufficiency of the offer of proof is, is one of the issues that is before this court. When you say similar cases, right. uh, and again, I'm not trying to parse your question, no, but no, I'm no, trying to accurately this. answer it. Right. And when you say similar cases, the offer of proof really didn't get there. I see. There were, just, there were just eight other cases. And again, when you go through Dr. Morris's testimony um, in the appendix, which is all two pages, um, all he talks about is two nerve cases. He talks about one nasal case has nothing to do with anything. Mm -hmm. And then he talks about one case with this type of surgery. So in terms of the similarity, it, yes, it is an issue of whether or not you can have a plan or scheme under 404B when in fact you have completely strike that. You have dissimilar situations. And I, I think you, you make an important point in that regard. So um, unless the court has questions, that's the sum and sum of my argument. Thank you, Mr. Kamenick. You have a minute to go. Thank you, Your Honors. Ms. Widener. I think that the questioning that has been given so far really do, does highlight some of the issues um, that are significant in this case. 
The fact of the matter is that Mrs. Merchant did suffer a permanent and catastrophic injury uh, to her tongue and this was evident from the symptoms that she experienced and told Dr. Carpenter about um, immediately after the surgery and for the next seven or eight months that she actually treated with him. And the importance of the records is that it helps establish that link. The defendant's um, experts, one of the things that they found the most significant for their opinions was the timing of the symptomology. And so, this, so when the things, uh, her symptoms actually occurred is very, very important. And Mrs. Merchant testified that she told him at every single time that she saw him over the course of those seven or eight months. Now, Dr. Carpenter's records don't reflect any of that. Dr. Carpenter was asked, uh, when asked, well, could she have told you about these and you just didn't write them down? What the jury heard is possibly, but it's highly unlikely. This is a surgeon who'd been a surgeon for 40 years. They heard about all of his credentials. He'd done, he considered these routine surgeries. He said that he had no memory of Mrs. Merchant. He had no memory of the surgery or the post-surgical course. So he himself has to rely on his records that he creates. And here's the problem. You have a system where the patient is obviously unconscious, the patient doesn't know what's going on, and one of the things that the defendant's uh, attorney, one of the points that were, was made is that who, who better to know what happened at surgery? He was asking Dr. Morris this, well, you weren't there. Who better to know what happened than Dr. Uh, Carpenter, who was there and he did his 23-minute surgery with this harmonic scalpel. Well, you're right. He's the only one who knows it. He's the one who creates the operative record. The operative note is, is for continuity of care. It's to protect patients. It's so that if something is going wrong or something happens, we can look back to see what happened. Counsel, His own, what's, your, yes. what's, your, um, what's your response to Justice Viviano's question about what the trial court was given to work with about why the evidence should have come in? Well, at the, um, at the motion in limine and also at trial when this was raised, the attorney had said very specifically that Dr. Carpenter has a common defense because he said this in all of these other cases. He says the records don't show that there was a problem, so there wasn't a problem. So is it enough to use one of the right terms from the 404B exception? Or should the, I mean, Judge Aquilino only heard, the trial judge only heard you know, we think it's, uh, he has a common defense, but nobody, it, it, it's, it's not the case that the lawyer identified this evidence is admissible under an exception to 404B, and here's why, right? Well, if the, if the issue is did she set out a specific um, 404B analysis, yeah. I, I would agree. I don't, when I read the transcripts, I yeah. didn't see something that specific. Did she mention 404B? Yes, it was mentioned. Did she talk about, you know, a commonality between uh, these other patients in Mrs. Merchant's case, yes. Did uh, in the offer of proof, um, Dr. Morris talked again about the commonalities between those cases and Mrs. Merchant's case. Um, so but, I think there a, was an a, appellate court has to evaluate whether the trial judge abused her discretion, right? And so it has to matter a little bit what theory she was given for why the evidence should be admissible when we're when when evaluating abuse of discretion is that would you agree with that i would agree the judge needs to know what it is she's being asked to, to do right. and i think in the pre-trial motion uh, that the defendant had brought um, it was his motion to to bring and the response to his request that the judge not allow any of the testimony was that well you should allow it because this is what it does um so it wasn't characterized in the sense that um, you have um, sometimes in a prosecution case, they have an obligation to file a notice. Right. And so the, you, you have the court rules that say you specifically in these types of cases, you bring it, you spell it out for the judge. And we don't have that for certainly for civil cases okay. or other cases. That's a good point. Yeah. So help, help me understand why um, the post-operative 
record keeping proves or is, or is probative of the question whether in this procedure something was done wrong. As I understand it, plaintiff's experts say that something went wrong and that the manifestation of this error occurs over time just as it did in this case. Defense experts say if something would have gone wrong as they claim, things, things would have been manifested sooner. So regardless what it says in the record, the question is, is plaintiff's expert correct that, I mean, no one's disputing that there's an injury. Is plaintiff's expert correct that this injury manifested over time and relates to the events of the surgery? Or is defense expert correct that if what plaintiff claims occurred, really did occur, this manifestation would have occurred more immediately? A plaintiff isn't saying it, this manifestation that my experts say took seven months really occurred the day after. That's not the case, right? She's saying this is how long it took, and the experts are saying that's exactly how long it would take if there was error here, and defense is saying no, no, no. If what they claim occurred really did occur, we would have seen this immediately. It, it, the record keeping really doesn't seem to, to weigh in under this circumstance. Well, respectfully, I think that the record keeping does, and I think the, the reason it does is because this is what the jury heard. They heard Dr. Carpenter tell them when asked, are you aware of other patients who's made this claim? No. That was a lie, and that was allowed to stand. And what the trial judge did is, is uh, outside the presence of the jury, told him what perjury was, um, said this is what the penalty would be, I'm going to give you time to talk to your attorneys, and then when he came, uh, uh, before the jury came back and reminded him he was under oath, and then they went on. But that falsehood was allowed to stand. So the jury hears that this has never happened before, and it was on a question asked by um, plaintiff's counsel. And plaintiff said, I told him every time that this was going on. So I think that that causes a huge problem. And the records are important for showing not just that we have a link, but the jury is faced with um, this, again, Dr. Carpenter, very experienced surgery, who comes in and says, I don't remember the surgery, but this is how they're done, and this is what I did. Why? Because this is how I've always done it. And plaintiff, what is she supposed to do? This is the evidence that she had, and she should have been allowed to make her arguments, instead of a doctor who's allowed to look at the records and say, it's highly unlikely that she ever told me any of this. And then say, I've never, no one else has ever made this kind of a complaint about, uh, about this before. So I think that you have to not ignore what the jury heard when you're talking about, um, as the defendant um, argues, well, this is really just a battle of the experts. Well, not necessarily. His experts also um, agreed that uh, her symptomology was consistent with a nerve injury, um, and they, but they said, that no, you would have seen something immediately. I don't think it really takes that long. Um, but they also had the records which showed nothing was wrong, healing nicely, healing nicely. And they said that, I think it was Dr. Borovic who had said that he'd seen, you know, or knew of patients who after the surgery might have had some tongue biting, drooling, those things. But those, thing, uh, those symptoms resolve in a couple of weeks if there's nothing wrong. We're talking about a woman who treated with this doctor for Eight, about eight months, eight months, and these symptoms simply got worse. They didn't get better, but his records show there was no problem. So he had a system, a plan. He had a method. He's the only one who could. He's the one who creates these records. And to allow this to happen, I think, sends a, 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 the wrong message, certainly. And if you have a case where this type of evidence can come in under a 404B theory, this is exactly how it should be used. And, and given the agreement of defense experts that, in fact, there is an injury here and the lack of record keeping, doesn't that make for really nice impeachment and cross-examination of the doctor? In terms of... Uh, are All right, her tongue is bad now, and your records say there is nothing wrong. How did this happen? Oh. 
And he was asked. His answer, I don't know. Now, this is an interesting... So this, to me, is effective cross-examination, and I'm trying to find out why the trial judge abused her discretion in saying the lack of record-keeping is there. They can cross-examine. It seems to be a battle of the experts. Where's the abuse of discretion? Well, I don't think that the... Um, that there was a sufficient ability to effectively cross-examine him on the records, and this is why. He said, first of all, flat out, it was highly unlikely, based on his records, that she told him anything. It's because it's, it's not there. The implication being, if there was anything significant, it would be there. So he says, of course, hey, maybe sometimes I didn't chart something. But he didn't say, I never chart these things. He didn't say, you know, I'm just a bad record keeper in all my cases. I'm like, if, if he wants to testify to that, I guess he could have. He didn't. The, the specific message that was sent to that jury is that he, does, that he charts the important things. Maybe he misses something here or there, but the important things he does. And we know this because he said it was highly unlikely that she said anything of significance to him because then it would be in the records. And it wasn't. So I think that the records are important because we have to have, a plaintiff needs to be able to have some kind of link. They've got to establish for proximate cause to show that the injury is related to the surgery. His ex explanation is things happen. We don't know. You know, life's a mystery. Well, we have someone who every step of the way was saying, this is going on. Something's wrong. My tongue looks funny. It feels funny. Something's wrong. I'm biting the back of it. I'm drooling excessively. Something's wrong. And to have a surgeon, to have any doctor not chart that, even if it doesn't mean anything ultimately, to not chart that so someone can say, oh, this was going on for this patient, it shouldn't be, shouldn't be allowed. It shouldn't be allowed. And she had a method of showing to the jury that this was not just uh, uh, a case of he, you know, Mrs. Merchant really didn't tell him anything. No, there were other cases where there were significant, significant complications where patients said they told him of their symptoms and they weren't being charted. And so what does he do in those cases? Couldn't have been me, couldn't have been the surgery, because look at the records. They were healing fine. Must have happened sometime later. We don't know. Life's a mystery. So again, I think that it is critical to be able to allow a patient, in cases where there is 404B type evidence, to be able to use that evidence uh, to help establish their case. I mean, uh, I mean what, do you, what do you make of the, the Court of Appeals majority statement, though, that uh, you failed to make any cognizable argument under 404B? And even they didn't say there was any suggestion of an abuse of discretion here. They just didn't address that issue to the best of my, my understanding. I mean, you're, you're talking kind of in the abstract about things that have some resonance, I think, for this court and for ordinary people hearing you. But I mean, doesn't this have to be presented within the proper legal forms and it just wasn't done in this case? If you're talking about the way it was brought to the trial court's attention, is, I'm, I just want to make sure I'm understanding. Well, the Court of Appeals majority noted that it was not clear under which rule of evidence you sought to admit what you're now generally describing as 404B evidence. Well, I think that the, the, the Court of Appeals majority did ultimately understand what it was because they clued in on it almost immediately about the common plan or scheme. And, and the trial attorney did say in uh, her argument to the trial judge that he had a common defense and that he's able to set this up, the system up, and use the same um, situation. So I think that it's there. Did she, could she have been clear? Absolutely. Could she have said the words, you know, 404B and here's what you have to show and here's how we show it? Yes, she could have. Um, I think that it was at least my reading of the transcript, you know, when I wrote the, the, the briefs, I mean, that, it came across to me that that's what she was talking about, and she did mention 404B. Um, so, and I think that the Court of Appeals majority saw that, and to speak to the issue of, of uh, uh, whether this is probative, I mean, the Court of Appeals majority made it very clear the jury should have been able to hear this. It was highly probative. Um, so I think that, uh, that, that the, this court does not need to grant leave on this case. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Mr. Kamenek, you have a very short time for a response. How much time is left? One minute. A um, couple things just to firm up the record. Um, I went back, page uh, 103A of the appendix. There is a reference to 404B in plaintiff's response to the original motion limine, but there's no argument. Um, at the time of the hearing on at 12-16-2004, appendix 189, the only court rules referenced are 403, 401, and 608. Much of the argument plaintiff presented was under 608. It was not under 404. And finally, at the time of trial, there is no mention of 404B. Um, there are questions asked about uh, the symptomology and, and how that affected this issue. And there's just, the last point I want to make to the court is uh, the testimony of the plaintiff towards the end of trial. Um, she was asked when the fasciculations, and I don't know if the court's familiar with that term, I was not, but they're spontane spontaneous contractions. Sometimes you see those, and I know I've had them in my eyelid, but these happen to be in the tongue, but th they were considered the more serious complications, as well as the deviation of the tongue. And at page 480 of the appendix, um, Ms. Merchant is asked, um, whether the first time she told anybody about this was in May of 2012. That was 21 months after the incident, and the answer was yes. The point I'm trying to make is that even she admitted that the first time she told any physician about the symptomology that we contend and that, that it demonstrates supposedly impacting the nerve was 21 months after the time of the surgery. So what happened in between and the record keeping they're relating to that and this whole bit about eight plaintiffs in the records, somewhat academic and somewhat immaterial. Thank you, Mr. Kamenek. Thank you, Ms. Widener. Thank you, Your Honor. Be submitted.